I've brought you here to Greatstone near Dungeness to show you these uh, strange looking concrete structures that lie abandoned at the edge of a waterlogged gravel pit here. Now, they look like early forms of abstract art, don't they? But they're not. They played a significant part in the history of Britain's defence system. After the First World War, the biggest threat to Britain's security was from the air. What the country needed was an operational edge, a way of pinpointing incoming enemy bombers before they reached the English coast. The old system relied on sight, using spotters with binoculars. Steady enemy aircraft over the channel, flying due west. But it wasn't effective at night or in bad weather conditions. The solution lay with one man, Lieutenant William Tucker. Tucker had spent much of the First World War in trenches using listening devices to search out enemy locations. By the 1920s, he decided to apply the same listening techniques to the skies. The result was a series of concrete structures like these along the south coast. They reflected the sound waves of incoming aircraft onto carefully placed microphones. And various sound mirrors survive, dotted along the south coast. But this is the only place you can see all three designs side by side. To explain how they work, I've come to meet Owen Lation, who's warden for the Dungeness National Nature Reserve. Owen. Hi, uh, Hello. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, Thanks good for meeting you. me here today. Well, these are absolutely fabulous. Yeah, aren't brilliant, they? these sound mirrors. Massive. Yeah. I love the location. Yeah, well. very, very good. This is a 20 foot sound mirror. This is the smaller one. This is the smaller one, the first one. Yeah. How does the technology actually work? Well, it's pointing out into the English Channel. Right. It's collecting sound waves from the enemy aircraft or potential enemy aircraft. Yeah. So you had a guy standing where I am with a sound trumpet pointing back into the, into the 20 foot dish. So he's got his back to the sea yeah. and he would have had a stethoscope on and he's moving that trumpet around trying to get a bearing of where the aircraft is. And remember with this one, it's very, very it's quite vertical. It's isn't vertical it? indeed. So it's sort if, of almost picking up things that are low. That's and right. Not way up there. So if the planes were coming in very high, they were in they were in trouble. So what they did then is they designed the 30 foot mirror, which where which they the where they the tilted the, the dish higher up into the sky to get the the higher aircraft that they were coming in. And also they had a, like a little room underneath where the listener was able to manoeuvre the microphone or the trumpet in the dish, so he was out of the elements. Yeah. Can I go and look at the big one? Yeah, come on, let's that, go and look. That's really just yeah, sort of very so impressive. amazing, isn't it? How big is that? Well, that's 200 foot. I work. All the information gathered here would be sent back to Military HQ at Hythe by phone, where it would be plotted out on a map. That would then give the RAF a chance to send up planes to meet the enemy. Incredible size when you get up to it, isn't it? Very impressive. 200 feet. Indeed, yeah. Uh, concave lengthways, but also vertically as well. I can see that when you look at the edges. Mm. How does this one work then? Well, you've got a, a set of microphones in a big arc around the forecourt of this 200 foot mirror, and you would have had a guy in the office and this window up here <laughs> okay. at the back. But you would have had several people as well, listeners, out on the front, and he would have been directing those listeners to get the bearings of where the aircraft are coming from. Right, so they've scaled up the operation. They, they've gone big now. Well, yeah. You can certainly say that, <laughs> can't you? Yeah, and was that accurate? Yes, it, 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 was an, it was more of an accurate system than the, the, the smaller mirrors, um, but the, rate, the, the length was still the same, 20, 25 miles, and yeah. it's back to the same old issue. The, the, the aircraft got faster, and so as an early warning system, it was becoming quite obvious that it was, it was struggling yeah. um, as time went on in the 1930s. Gosh, I'm so pleased they're still here. Yeah. This is a real eye-opener for me. What was the downside? Well, the downside was that we're very close to the sea here and the housing development or the pressures were creeping down the coast. Remember, these were built with, in a very bare, hostile, quiet environment. environment. And also radar came along um, in the late 1930s. So quickly, that of the range that they could pick up the aircraft was much better than these sound mirrors. Yeah. And they became obsolete quite quickly. Impressive structures, though. Oh, they, they are, aren't they? Yeah. Well, I'm pleased they're here today, yeah. you know that, I really am. 
So noisy urban development in this once desolate area, combined with faster planes, meant the sound mirrors were already struggling. But it was the advances in radar that produced the final nail in the coffin. It was all over for these sound mirrors and Tucker retired, thinking all his efforts were in vain. But these structures do stand as a monument to a man whose work was to have a profound effect on the outcome of World War II. The communication systems that Tucker developed between his mirrors and HQ were so effective that it was copied by the radar team and led directly to their success. <laughs>